In this video, we're going to cover the notes for Chapter 8, which is accounting for receivables. We'll start with some definitions. Accounts receivable, notes receivable, trade receivable, and other receivable. Account receivable, or accounts receivable, are amounts owe, customers owe on account that result from the sale of goods and services. A note receivable is a written promise for amounts to be received normally requires the collection of interest. A trade receivable is simply the notes and accounts receivable that result from sales transactions. So generically they're grouping them together and say they're trade receivables because they were a uh, result of a sales transaction. And finally other receivable. It's a non-trade receivables such as, such as interest, loans to officers, advances to employees, income taxes. Those are all examples of receivables that a company might have, but they're not um, from selling goods or services. It's not part of their normal business. It just comes about. We've seen a lot of this in previous chapters again, but we'll re review it. <clears throat> company sold merchandise on account for $5,000, terms 210 net 30, customer returns $500 with the merchandise after two days and pays the amount due on day eight. So to record the sale, we debit accounts receivable, credit sales revenue for the $5,000. On the return, we debit the contra account sales returns and allowances, credit accounts receivable $500, so accounts receivable decreases because the customer no longer owes that amount. Third one here, we're going to record the receipt of payment. So it was paid on day eight, which is less than the 10 required to get the discount. So they received the discount. We're going to credit accounts receivable for the full amount due, which is 4,500. That's the original amount due from the sale minus the return, so 4,500 is what's left. We're going to debit sales discount. The sales discount is 2% of what's due, so 4,500 times 2%, that is $90. And then we're gonna receive cash. The cash we receive is the difference between what is due and the sales discount. In this example, we're receiving $4,410. So again, we've seen all of those in previous chapters. Um, we're focusing on the accounts receivable in Chapter 8 and, and seeing how that balance changes um, more than doing the sales. But as we said many times, this accounting is cumulative. You learn a little bit of one thing, you're going to learn some other things, and we're just going to repeat some items. So that's what we're doing here in this chapter. Now we'll get into valuing accounts receivable. So this is new, we haven't seen this before, this chapter. A couple methods that we look at, direct write-off method and the allowance method. The direct write-off method is a non-GAAP method of accounting for uncollectibles that involves expensing accounts at the time they are determined to be uncollectible. So remember, when you issue credit, or you are issuing credit when you sell something on account, you're taking a risk that that customer may not be able to pay the full amount due when it's due. Sometimes that risk comes to fruition and you have to write off accounts or determine that you're not going to be collecting that account and then you take it to expense. So the direct write-off method is saying once you determine that's not collectible, you just take it to expense at that. Again, that's a non-GAAP method. So if you're following GAAP, you can't use it. You have to use the allowance method, which is a gap method of accounting for uncollectibles that involves estimating uncollectible accounts at the end of each period. So they look at your accounts receivable, you have uh, a determination, predetermined amount of percentage usually of receivables that you don't think are going to be collected. You apply that to your accounts receivable and that's the amount of allowance that you need to have in your allowance for doubtful accounts account. The cash or net realizable value is the net amount the company expects to receive in cash. So in our 
allowance method, it's the gross accounts receivable less the allowance that they've set up. Percentage of receivable basis, that's the method by which management estimates what percentage of receivables will result in losses from uncollectible accounts. And we saw that in the lecture where they took an aging schedule and had different percentage losses or expected losses um, for different buckets in the aging schedule. That brings us to number five, aging the accounts receivable. It's the analysis of re receivable balances by the length of time they have been unpaid. So you, everything is not due until the due date. And then once the due date passes, it's typically 30 days. You put them in different buckets of what's one to 30 days, 31 to 60, 61 to 90, over 90, etc. Sometimes you break down the one to 30 into, you know, like the first week and then everything else. So if it's just a day or two past due, um, you don't worry about it as much as when it gets two or three weeks past due. But taking that aging and, and showing how old the receivables are is, is aging their accounts receivable. Factor of accounts receivable. That's the sale of the receivables to a finance company or bank. They buy your receivables, they pay you cash, you pay a service charge for that. They then, the bank or the finance company, owns the receivables and, the, and your customers have to pay them instead of paying you. It's a pretty common practice and uh, you know more companies are, are doing it because customers are wanting longer payment terms so they can hold on to their cash longer. So it's a way that the, the seller can get their cash earlier. And then allowance for doubtful accounts. This is a contra account to accounts receivable. Shows the estimated accounts receivable that will not be collected in the future. We touched on that earlier. We use the allowance method you use this account. Receive a percentage of receivable basis is a method that you can use where you put a percentage to your accounts receivable to determine what you think is not going to be collected. And then you put it in this allowance for doubtful accounts account. It's a contra asset account. It's got a normal credit balance. Remember contra accounts have a normal balance different or opposite of what the account they're contra to. So this is contra to accounts receivable. Accounts receivable has a normal debit balance. This contra account has a normal credit balance. And it's on the balance sheet, goes in current assets with the um, accounts receivable. Now we'll look at how you actually do these write-off methods, the direct write-off method and the allowance method. The direct write-off method, again, it's a non-GAAP measure, but it's important to understand how it's done and how is it done? Direct expense of the account. When you determine something is uncollectible, that's when it's done. When you determine an account is uncollectible, you directly expense it. The journal entry, what that looks like, is a debit to bad debt expense and a credit to accounts receivable. So you remove the accounts receivable from your books, your customer isn't gonna pay you, and you take it to expense, bad debt expense. The allowance method, it's an estimate of accounts receivables that will be uncollectible. So we've talked about the percentage of receivables method. It's a common method where you look at the aging and put a percentage based on history and pay based on credit risk um, of, the, of your customers to determine how much is uncollectible. There are other methods that you can use to estimate. Um, the important thing is that you're consistent period to period, year to year, on how on that method. When is it done? It's at the end of the accounting period or year end. So if you're producing financial statements throughout the year, like on the quarter, half year, you might do it then, but then definitely at the year end, you look at what the receivables are and, and you make an adjustment. What does the journal entry look like when the amount is estimated? It's a debit to bad debt expense. So the same expense account that we saw in the direct write-off method. But instead of reducing our accounts receivable directly, we use this contra account allowance for doubtful accounts and credit. It has the same idea of the direct write-off method in that it lowers the realizable value of the accounts receivable, but 
with the allowance method at the time you make this entry when it's estimated you don't know for sure which accounts are not going to be collected you haven't identified specific accounts yet where in the direct write-off method you have so what happens when you do identify an account that's going to be uncollectible under the allowance method we don't take the expense because we did that already with the estimate but we reduce our allowance for doubtful accounts with the debit and just like in the direct write-off method we reduce our accounts receivable because that's not going to get paid by the customer using the allowance method the amount of net receivables immediately before this write-off and immediately after is stays the same because you're reducing the allowance and you're re reducing the same amount of receivables and that's what you're trying to do is show what you uh, believe is going to be the actual cash that comes into the cost into the company so if you write off an account to that allowance it doesn't change that amount of cash coming in recording the sale of receivables to a factor again this is when a bank or a finance company is going to buy your receivables customers will then pay this bank or finance company this factor you get your cash earlier and you pay a service charge so we debit cash we credit the service charge expense or debit the service charge expense and credit accounts receivable the accounts receivable credit is the amount of receivables you're selling so if you're selling five hundred thousand dollars of receivables you would take that full amount off your books that's the amount that the factor will receive from the customers the amount of cash the company receives is going to be less than that because of the service charge service charge is the amount of receivables sold times the service charge percentage that's equals the service charge expense and that difference from the amount that you're receiving or you're selling in the accounts receivable is the cash you receive now we'll look at two different ways to record credit card sales one recording a credit card sale on a national credit card one with a store credit card and there are differences between these if you have a national credit card if you think of Visa discover American Express MasterCard those are the big national ones we treat that as a cash sale so we're going to receive the cash not immediately but within a day or two three days at the most probably so we can treat it as cash sale it's a we have to pay a fee for accepting the credit card so the entry to, that we record when we make a sale in a credit card using a national credit card is we debit cash we debit service charge expense and we credit sales revenue sales revenue credit is the amount of the sale service charge expense is the amount of the sale times the service charge percentage the difference is the cash that we receive we debit cash for that amount even though the customer isn't handing cash to us we record it that way and we'll receive it in our bank because the banking system will will move the cash to, into our bank within a day or two then a store credit card which is a credit card that you can only use at a particular store it's branded to that store and, and that's the only place you can use it we're not talking about branded credit cards that are also a national card so Best Buy offers a Best Buy Visa card you can use that Visa card anywhere that Visa is accepted you can also use it at Best Buy so that's still considered a national card these are credit cards that are only used in a particular store I think there are less and less of these coming around I've noticed that a lot of the store credit cards that I've seen before or had before is are turning into uh, you know Visa co-branded MasterCard co-branded so they're becoming national but there's still some out there and to record a sale there it's not a cash sale like a national credit card we're actually giving credit to our customers so we're going to debit accounts receivable for the amount of the sale credit sales revenue for the amount of the sale since the customer is going to pay us eventually 
the company that has the credit card there and not the national credit card company, we're going to receive the full amount. We don't have a service charge that we have to um, worry about when we record the sale. Looking at notes receivable, we have some new terms. So we have some new definitions or, or terms we want to define. Maker, that is the party in a promissory note who is making the promise to pay. So remember the notes receivable has a promissory note, a written document saying that the maker will pay the payee at some time in the future, usually with a interest rate attached to it. The payee is the party to whom payment of a promissory note is to be made. Interest calculation, so usually interest on notes, it's the face value of the note times the annual interest rate times time in terms of one year. That equals the interest. Now remember, if it's the number of days when the maturity is, so it could be 90 days, 60 days, 120 days, whatever it is, we typically use 360 days in a year to figure that amount of time. It's just easier calculation than using 365. Um, if it, the time on the note is months, it will, you just take, you know, the number of months divided by 12 and that type of thing. But if you do it um, in days, use 360 as the denominator. Honoring of, honoring of the note. We say the note has been honored when the maker pays in full at its maturity date, which paying in full includes the interest that is paid. Interest is paid at the same time as the note is paid off. When you're looking at maturity dates and the date is in days, so you omit the date of the note, but include the due date. So you need to know how many months each, each month has, how many days each month has. So an example, $10,000, 5%, a 90-day note issued on July 1st. So we start with July 2nd to July 31st is 30 days. August 1st to August 31st is another is 31 days. So that's 61 days so far. 90 minus 61 is 29. So the note is due on September 29th. Once we know when the note is due, we can do some journal entries, computing the interest, again, face value times the annual interest rate times time is the interest. So in this example, $10,000 times 5% times 90 divided by 360 is 125. A note can be issued to settle an open account, which means it's a customer, they have an accounts receivable, they come to the company and say they, they're having trouble paying it for whatever reason, and they want to issue a promissory note to pay an amount in the future, the amount that's due plus interest. So this is what this example is saying is that the issue of a note to settle an open account, you would debit notes receivable for the face value of the note and credit accounts receivable so you take it out of your accounts receivable bucket, put it in notes receivable, and show that on your financial statement say you have a note receivable. You can also issue uh, notes for cash. So if one company was borrowing money from another company and they did it with a note, it would be a debit to note receivable credit to cash to the company because they're going to receive that cash back in the future and they're sending that cash to the customer or the, the, the maker of the note at this point. So if the note is honored, record the note paid in full on September 29th, the due date. Okay, same note, 10,000, 5%, 90 day. We're gonna debit cash. It's gonna be the face value of the note plus the interest. We're gonna credit notes receivable for 10,000. So the face value, we're gonna reduce our notes receivable by the 10,000. And we're going to record revenue of $125 because that's the, the interest that we are earning on that note. And that's why the cash we receive is 125 
that interest revenue comes from that interest calculation we did earlier. Okay. Now remember, we didn't deal with a financial statement date in this example. If there's a financial statement date in between when the note is paid and when it was issued, you have to do an adjustment for the interest earned, the interest revenue at the time of the date and that becomes interest re interest receivable. So there's examples in the book and in the lecture about that. Uh, make sure you understand that as well. That's it for the notes for chapter eight. Again, as usual, if you have any questions, have any problems, please send me an email, reach out. We can set up some time to, to talk and make sure we um, get your questions answered and make you make sure you understand the material. Thank you.